All right. What else? This and that. Here we go. Welcome to the Big Honker Podcast, brought to you by our good friends at Shin Gear. I'm Jeff Stanfield with the world famous Andy Shaver. Shingear.com. Great waders, great boots, great everything. Yep, check out boots will be here tomorrow. Can't wait to wear them. With us today from Knoxville, Tennessee, Mr. Gary Christian. Gary, how are you doing, sir? Doing good. How are you? I'm doing wonderful, sir. Good. You have I a got a golf course, so I'm doing pretty good. What'd you shoot today? 75. Damn. Oh, damn. Did you play from the tips? Uh, blues. Blues. Let me tell you, Andy scores. That's Andy score in nine holes. He's a 150 golfer. Or maybe six. <laughs> Literally <laughs> might be the best, the worst golfer in the United States of America. If they had a worst golfer tournament, legit guys that are good athletes that can't play golf, he would win hands down. Nobody's <laughs> safe around me. Like even people behind me, there's been times where I've like hit the top of the ball somehow and it rolled back. So... <laughs> Well, my wife nearly killed a guy about three months ago. She he pulled up too far and she shanked one and hit him right in the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> Did you laugh? But he lived, and she parted the hole. <laughs> That's good then. Yeah, <laughs> wasn't good for him. But yeah, no, I, no there, kidding. Right? There was a tough old man in Wichita Falls. A tough guy. He was an All American high school football player. Played college football. Played linebacker, and he was a tough, tough wampus cat. And he's playing golf, and they were teeing, and some guy teed off on a par three before they got off, and the ball hit him right on his ear, and it sliced his fucking ear. Mm. And it was just <laughs> holding yeah. half his ear, and he had to have it all stapled back together, and it was bleeding. And the guy come up there, and he said, "If I couldn't hit a ball any harder than that shit, I'd quit playing." Mm. That's what he said to him. But lucky didn't whip that guy's ass. Damn. Yeah, that, that no would hurt. that would not be good. So. Le- the reason, uh, the the way that we got in touch, uh, who was it that put Rip, us in? Rip Polk. Yeah, put us in touch with you, and um, you know, you've got an amazing story. It's a tragic story. Um, your daughter and her boyfriend were kidnapped and murdered uh, by what four uh, African American gentlemen? What in two thousand seven? Uh, well, four men and one woman. Four men and one woman. Yeah. 2007. What, as a parent, that is about the worst thing that can happen. You have no idea, bro. When when you got the phone call, what time of day was it? Was it in the morning or in the afternoon? Uh, We didn't get a phone call necessarily. It was um, that Saturday night, uh, Saturday morning. She went to work and um, told us that she was going to her best friend's apartment when she got off work. And her and her boyfriend, he was playing golf, and he was going to come pick her up, and they were going to a birthday party, and they never showed up to the birthday party. Um, I didn't know it until the next morning. Um, And then everybody, her friends, all of us were calling her. Wouldn't answer the phone, and that wasn't like Shannon. Um, we started calling um, 911 to report her missing, and um, the police, um, later on, the FBI, um, everybody had an excuse why they couldn't help us. Um, Sheriff's Department, or the Law enforcement here in Knoxville said that they had to have uh, had to be missing for 48 hours before they could file a report. Try to explain to them that um, we knew her. 
I knew what the problem was. They thought she'd run off and eloped or whatever. Right. But this was a girl that um, she had, uh, she held down two jobs, um, had a 4.5 grade point average at the University of Tennessee, um, straight as an arrow. Mm -hmm. And we tried to explain that, you know, we knew something was wrong. And uh, it was still nothing they could do to help. Finally, uh, a, det a detective, uh, one officer finally took a report. And uh, the officer that was in charge that night um, said that if, if basically, uh, he did say it, um, that his suggestion was if we wanted anybody looking for a daughter, that I'd be looking for her myself. Mm. So my son and I did just that. We had gotten some information from uh, Verizon where her phone had pinged last. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't even know. It said it was on the Cherry Street Tower. We didn't even know uh, where that tower was. So I got a friend of mine that was a retired police officer to meet me. And uh, he showed us where the tower was and how to search those streets. And uh, on Sunday night, actually Monday morning, about 12.35, I believe it was, um, we found her forerunner. She wasn't in it. And my friend, he, he was running the uh, pound. So he called some code in to the police department, and cops came from everywhere. And... Um, they brought forensics in and the whole bit. And then they decided they had to take the forerunner into the town to get it inside so that the uh, um, investigators could look at it better the next morning. And we asked them, hey, you know, help us look for her. She's around here somewhere. Mm -hmm. And um, they said they couldn't until they had some evidence that she was hadn't driven the forerunner down there herself. Well, the, hell, the, for, the, the seat on the forerunner was pushed back as far as you could get it. Right. And I pointed that out to them. And uh, still, they they just brought in a flatbed, put the forerunner on it, took it to the pound, and then they were gone. My son and I and some of um, Shannon and Chris's friends were down there with us by then. And... Uh, we started searching and we searched all the way until um, Tuesday afternoon by ourselves, day and night, looking everywhere. We were going in abandoned buildings. We were going in places you wouldn't want to go in. Yeah. Um, we had we had some of the guys were, were going under houses, ab abandoned houses, going under it. They were looking everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um. They um, came in Tuesday afternoon and said that um, they had gotten some evidence and would we get our people off the street where they could do their job? And I'm like, hell no. I'm not going anywhere until I find my daughter. We're the only ones that are doing anything. Yeah, no shit. Yeah, we're, we were the only ones for two days that were doing anything. Yeah. And... Um, they, uh, the forensics people, uh, Wednesday morning, uh, recovered an envelope, you know, like a bank envelope. Mm -hmm. Um, it's got the little window on it. They found a fingerprint on that envelope. And, uh, that's when they really got involved and started searching for the people that, uh, own the house and, and, uh, but when they found that, uh, that, um, that afternoon, they, um, uh, friend of mine was in his car and he was, had the, had the, um, uh, call me and said, man, you know, the house is right next to the trash company. I said, yeah. He said, uh, 
there's something going on up here. Uh, the cops just showed up. They're all around the house, cop cars. Um, now SWATs drove up and they're they're all they're swarming the house. He said, "You need to get up here." So I started in that direction, and an officer um, stopped me and said, "Are you Mr. Christian?" And I said, "Yes." And uh, he said, uh, "The sheriff and the chief of police would like to talk to you." And our command center was set up. He showed me where it was. And so I called my buddy back and said, keep eyes on that house and let me know what's going on. The chief and the sheriff want to talk to me. So we went up to the command center and about five minutes after uh, um, we got there, they showed up. And I, I knew the chief police very well. Um, and um, we went in uh, command center and Ivy put his hand on my knee and said, brother, I, I, we, I don't know any other way to put it, but we got bad news. We found your daughter. She is deceased. Mm -hmm. And um, at that minute, at that second, I lost it, bro. I was... Um, all I wanted to know was who did it. Mm -hmm. And uh, for 10 years, actually 14 years, I lived for that. I, uh, that's all I wanted. Was revenge. I, yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to kill the people that killed her. Very understandable. I, I demanded to see her, and they said that it was not possible right then. Um, see, they, they um, raped her um, repeatedly uh, by two of the men. Um, we're not sure that the woman didn't have her take too. Um, there was one that was just a drug head and, uh, he was sitting there watching everything that was going on. Um, we think a third man raped her repeatedly, each one of them. And, um, uh, Two of them, the ringleaders of this little group, had been in uh, penitentiary uh, for carjacking and got out. One of them got out on good behavior, and one of them got out on a technicality. Had they still been in prison, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Um, but um, they raped her. They um, tortured her. They um, beat her. The medical examiner said she had a bruise on the back of her, started on the back of her head and went completely through her brain. Yes. Mm. Um, where they had banged her head against the floor and the wall. Um, if I, if I show, I could show you some pictures of just the pictures that they allowed to be shown in the courtroom. They ruled out, there was 368 pictures. They ruled out all but 30. Why? Because they were too graphic? They were too graphic. The judge thought of the, the defendant's attorneys said that it would it, um, influence the jury. 
Well, it should well, it influence. Should. It's horseshit. I mean, this is what happened. That it was too grotesque. Man, sure. I got. A, I stood up in a courtroom and I said, "I'll show you grotesque." Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That I mean that that doesn't. It, this is. It's not like these photographs were fabricated. Like this is what these men and but, and woman did. Like it should be admissible. This is what happened. This this these were were pictures that were made by the medical examiner during the autopsy. Mm -hmm. And there was parts of her body that if I showed you certain pictures that were like close-ups showing the damage that they did, there was parts of her body that I could have shown you and you wouldn't have known what it was. Wow. How how long was she in the house before um, they disposed of her body? How long did she live through that hell? Was it ever determined? Yeah. yeah. She um, she left her um, she left Tara's apartment, her best friend's apartment. When Chris had got there, he he it was a pretty day, and they decided to play an extra nine holes. So. I think she was pretty pissed at him <laughs> um, that he was late picking her up, that she could have gone to the birthday party with her friend Tara, but she elected to wait and let Chris come pick her up. And um, they left somewhere around 10 o'clock uh, Saturday night. And um, at 12.05, listen to this. This freaked me out. At uh, 12.35, I got a phone call on our landline. You know, I was back when they had phones that had a wire that was ran from a pole to in the house. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, and I had probably, well, an unbelievable, normal conversation with Shannon. All her friends had been calling her, seeing where they were. And, uh, evidently they had asked her who was calling. And I think she said her mother her, her, her daddy. And, uh, they had her call according to the, um, psychologist that studies this kind of thing. You know, how, how people are kidnapped and they're, they're made to go along with what their kidnappers are doing, right. whatever. Yeah. Well, they had one of those people, and uh, they said uh, that in their opinion, what had happened was they had had her call me to get me to quit calling her. Right. To tell me that everything was all right. And, dude, I swore up and down because, I mean, she was a beautiful girl. She was smart. Um, but she was a girl. I mean, she, Cry baby. Mm -hmm. And for three years, I told the district attorney's office, all the law enforcement, because there was every, everybody was involved, ATF, you name it. Um, I told them, I said, there's no way that she was in there. They didn't have control of her when she called me. She was too normal. Right was um down to the I told her I loved her and she said I love you more. Mm -hmm. I said no I love you more and I hung up on her. So so where that, do you where do you think she, at 1235 where do you think that she was? I think that they had um well now I know about 1030 between 10 and 
they were coming down the steps of Kara's apartment going to Shannon's forerunner. The door was open. Um, Shannon was sitting in the forerunner and uh, Eric Boyd got in the passenger side door of the forerunner, put a gun on Shannon and Davidson come up behind Chris, which was standing in the door. And according to one of these idiots, um, they were kissing. So Davidson went up behind Chris and put a gun to his head and they forced him in the very back of the forerunner, tied him up. Uh, they put Shannon in the back seat with Davidson and, um, Boyd was in the front seat. Uh, no, Boyd was in the back seat and Davidson was driving. And Covinson, David's, Davidson's brother, was driving the car they went over there in. So they were they were in their cust in their control about ten between ten and ten thirty Saturday night. And the coroner said that she died sometime around um, five o'clock, four o'clock Sunday. A.M. or P.M.? P.M. P.M. Mm. So the whole time we were looking for her. Yeah. I mean, I passed by that house probably 500 times. I don't know how many. Yeah. And I mean, just never thought to, never had any reason to look in there. So there was no, the, the, there was no sign of life. I mean, there was no cars. There was no nothing. The, so, um, so the call at twelve thirty five. She were they was she in the car? Was she, were they just uh, driving around? In, no, she was in the house in Chipman Street. What was this? A random? They, they, they forced her to. To, to, make, to make yeah. the call. Was, was this a random, like, carjacking? Is that what was going on here? Or had they targeted them before? No. Um, you know, you find out through, we had uh, uh, eight murder trials all total. Dear God. That we had, that we had to live through. Um. Um, what, what was the question? Was this premeditated? Had they been looking at oh, yeah. them? No. Had they been stalking um, them? Or was this just all no. just a random act they, of carjacking? They, um, Davidson had said that, that he was tired of not having any money. He was tired of not having any dope. And he was tired of not having a ride. They were going to, um, jack a car so the three of them went to Kara's apartment complex just driving around their dope dealer lived in the um, in that apartment complex mm -hmm. and and don't get me wrong this was a nice apartment complex I right. mean it was it had a lot of college students in it but it was it was nice it was uh, kept up good um, in a good part of town. Um, they went over there to see if they could score some dope and was sitting there looking for a car to jack. And here comes Shannon and Chris walking down the steps and, and, um, uh, took them. So what, when did, what made this go from just a carjacking to this incredibly heinous crime of rape and murder and torture. What happened? Well, um, Geraldo. Yeah. Um, they come down and did an interview several other national talk show people 
did interviews. And every one of them tried every which way they could to get me to say that it was racial, that it was a hate crime. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say that it was a hate crime because in the state of Tennessee, there is no state hate crime. There's a federal, there's not a state. I don't think that they got together at the house on Chipman Street and said, we're going to go find some white kids to carjack. Right. So was it racial? I don't think so in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but here's what I do know. Once they had them, it was all about their stuff. It became racial. It became a hate crime. Right. When they found Davidson hiding in an abandoned house, he had on Chris's tennis shoes. Really? They were two sizes too little. Mm. Coleman, the girl, they found her in Kentucky, and she had all Shannon's stuff in her purse. Davidson had called his ex-girlfriend to come over there Sunday morning and he gave her a bunch of clothes and said, these are clothes that I, I got at a, what is, what, whatever kind of store it is where, um, Goodwill. Like a, yeah, that kind of thing. And they were Shannon's clothes. Right. Um, they had him a forerunner. Well, they couldn't spell forerunner. Yeah. Um, how, how long from the time this happened and you found out to the cops had someone in handcuffs? Well, and that reminds me of something else too, but. Well, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. They had, it was, um, Tuesday afternoon when they found her, she was, I'll tell you about that in a minute. It was Tuesday afternoon and it was Friday, Thursday, I think. Thursday afternoon, I saw a thing on the news where two of them, excuse me, yeah, two of them had been arrested. It was that weekend when they got Coleman, the girl, uh, Covins, Davidson's brother, and um, Thomas, out of a house in Kentucky. And that's, that's where the ATF came in and the TBI. They, um, they, our deputies and investigators flew in helicopters into Kentucky and landed on the interstate and the feds met them there and swore them in as deputies so that everything would be legal. And then they went to where they had, gotten information that they were and they pulled them out of that house. Um, they, Davidson tried to strangle Shannon to kill her and he couldn't. So they hogtied her They put her in five garden variety, big black trash bags. They put a plastic bag over her head and sealed it around her neck. And then they stuffed my baby 
in a trash can pushed her in the corner of the kitchen. She had freed one of her hands The coroner said, the medical examiner said that she had struggled. There was bruising on her arms where she had struggled to get out of whatever they had her. The, it was shredded curtains that they tied her up with. And they said um, that she had struggled, had one arm free. When they took the lid off of the trash can, all you could see was like her elbow. Before they did all of that, they made her drink Clorox mm -hmm. to try to get rid of their DNA. Mm. Uh, that was when she was still alive. Mm -hmm. um, when they told me that my daughter was dead, I grew up in East Texas, just a good old East Texas cowboy. Um, love life. Been involved in church since I was eight years old. And um, when I... Uh, when I heard the word, she is deceased, I stormed out of that command center and I went to the back of that parking lot and they said that I was screaming at the top of my lungs that I didn't want God in my life anymore. Mm -hmm. I didn't need him. I didn't need him. Every day I prayed, Lord, take care of my children, protect my children. And, and the way that that I where I went, I blame God for not protecting. And brother, I lost it. So, I uh, I don't think anybody can blame you. No, I, I became a very scary person. I didn't care if I lived another day. I'd have gladly died if you'd have let put them five in front of me and let me put my nine millimeter to their head and shoot them. I could have done it and slept like a baby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You probably could have done a lot more than that to him and slept like a baby. Well, yeah, my cousin Rip, he knows where some alligators are down in South Louisiana, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, a lot of pigs, a, a lot of pigs in West Texas too. There's a lot of good places yeah, out here. Well, there's a lot in Tennessee too. <laughs> um, bought some wood right after she died that winter. The guy that brought my wood to me said, "Mr. Christian, I'm just going to tell you, I got some hogs out here, about twelve of them. They'll eat license plates. They'll eat buckets. They'll eat anything you throw in there with them. They'll eat it. And if you bring them to me." they won't find no DNA. Right. And brother, if I could have got my hands on them, I'd have took them to him. So none of them ever made bail, I'm assuming, after they got arrested. Did they? No, they, they arrested them federally uh, in federal court so they couldn't get bail. And um, shortly after they were, were arraigned, then they turned them over to the state uh, district attorney's office to be prosecuted in state court. Um, they gave us reasons for that. I don't, I don't believe it was right, but you know, I mentioned to you that there was, um, eight trials. Yes. yes. Two of them got retrials because the judge was caught doing drugs while the trials were going on. So they tried each one of them individually. So out of the five trials, 
Eric Boyd was tried in federal court and all they had on him as far as DNA or any real evidence um, was just the other one's words implementing him in, in helping Davidson hide out after it happened. And, um, but they tried him in federal court and got him on accessory after the fact, put him back in prison. And the, the kicker is, is that he took Chris, Chris never went in the house. Boyd took Chris to an abandoned building down there and raped and tortured him, then took him to the railroad track and shot him twice in the back and once in the back of the head. Um, Boyd did this to Chris? Boyd? Yeah. Yeah. And set him on fire. And we didn't find out because they had to identify the body. We didn't find this out until um, Monday morning. Mm -hmm. I had just left the uh, TBI office and um, they gave me their spiel about why they couldn't help us. And I was headed back down to start searching for Shannon again. And um, they, uh, we got a phone call saying that the body that they had found on that railroad track, it wasn't 200 yards from where we found Shannon's forearm, right. was definitely Chris. And that's when we, the search really started to heat up because we, I knew something was wrong. They'd already killed one. The likelihood of them killing the, the second was probably pretty high in your mind. Yes, it was. So a after this is done and they arrest them, how long did you have to wait to go to the first trial? Three years. Jesus Christ, that's terrible. Were you privy to the uh, details of this case? before the trial like did did you have some glimpse as to what your daughter went through uh those that day two days or was it in trial whenever you found out all of the i said, bad I said at a table i sat at a table with uh a dear friend of mine and looked at 365 pictures of what they had done to her mm in the, in the uh, district attorney's office. Um, I had a friend that was a Texas Ranger call me just a few nights after we had found Shannon. And he, I made a comment about the media was all over me. <laughs> it's another friend of mine lives here in Knoxville. When I come out of that command center, I walked out and there was a cam a, a lady and a newscaster and uh, a cameraman standing there waiting on us to come out. And when I come out, I, I'm not sure what all I was saying to him, but I, all I remember is, is this friend of mine stood between us and said that if they didn't get that camera out of my face that somebody was going to find them out in the middle of Cherry Street with that camera stuck in their ass. <laughs> wow. And wow. Yeah. that that was my relationship with the media <laughs> until this friend of mine called me and he said, let me tell you something. There's only one thing that the, that the Attorney General is afraid of. And that's the me that's the media because that's the people. And when they start jacking you around, you just tell them where you're going and who you're going to tell. And I made that real clear with them from the very beginning that I wanted to know everything they knew when they knew it. Right. They didn't have to. But it was such a high-profile case, they didn't have a whole lot of choice. 
they included us in every step of the way. We knew we went to every hearing. Um, you're talking about hard to sit through. I can imagine. Mm. Being and, that- listen, and, and listening to the defense attorneys. Let me let me tell you something about defense attorneys. They can go into a court of law where everything is supposed to be tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Mm-hmm. Every witness that gets on that stand, including myself, had to say that. But a defense attorney can go into a court of law and lie his head off. All day long. All day long. About and he can say anything he wants to say. Was it uh, the the defense attorneys? Um, I mean, I don't even know how you can possibly come up with a defense for what happened. They have to. Well, I understand that, but I mean. No, there's no, there's is no reasonable. Where, is, defense. is that where the lies start to come in? Like they just try to make it somehow put it on your daughter and her boyfriends, uh, put it on, put it, put it on their plate. That's the reason that they got carjacked that night. Is that what the defense attorneys did? They, um, at one point, um, Coleman's, no, Davidson's attorney, Well, they get they had two or three. You they they appoint attorneys and and then second chairs and all that. They get like three attorneys. Um, but they tried to say that the reason that Shannon and Chris were down there, the reason they got harmed was that they were down there partying with this bunch. These five people? Yeah. Mm. Now, I'm not an attorney. Mm -hmm. And I ain't the most brilliant bulb in the lamp, but I ain't stupid. Right. So I go and I get a good friend of mine, which is his wife, worked for a hospital, which is one of the jobs Shannon had. She went and pulled her medical records where they do the drug test. Mm -hmm. In the last 24 months of of Shannon's life, she was drug tested three times with that hospital. Once when she got hired as assistant manager of the shoe store, Then the medical examiner's report showed she was drug free. Now I go back 24 months and I had the proof right. in my hands. Right. That she didn't do drugs. How is that as a parent to hear? I mean, you know, now all of a sudden, you know, it's bad enough what's happened, but you've got a, an individual that is just spreading lies about your daughter and about what the way that she conducted herself. And like you, like you said, you've got proof. There's no, the toxicology report is all zeros and I've got 24 months of her being clean. I couldn't use it, bro. You couldn't. Because I went and got that. Oh, the attorneys, the, the DA's office had not used that or shown that to be on the list of evidence. Oh, I see. So if I would have shown them that, they would have had to show the, the others that. And they kept telling me, it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to believe that. Everybody that knew Shannon knew that she didn't do drugs. Knew that she wasn't down there partying with them. And, and I broke two fingers when I heard it. Really? I walked out of the courtroom and I hit the door. I just sucker punched the door. When I got to it, 
because they done told, threatened me and all that about showing my ass in the courtroom could get them a mistrial. Mm -hmm. I kept telling them, turn them loose. Right. One at a time. Are all of them at the same time? Yeah, mistrial would have played into your. I mean, you know, if, if revenge was on your okay. mind, a mistrial oh, in the bat in the worst thing in the world that that could have happened in your mind. I told the state attorney general, if you let one of them out, I'll kill them before they eat dinner. <laughs> and yeah, I'm in it. I'm and you're gonna it. find a hard time finding a court that's gonna uh, do anything to you for that either. What well, I don't understand, so that so y'all there was. <laughs> Golly, I talk. He said, "Miss Christian, you can't think like that." Well, I explained to him why I could. Fuck if I can't. I'm going to for a long and time. I, said, I told him, I said, "If you let them out, if you let one, I'm on the street. I'll kill them before they eat dinner." And he said, "Well, you can't do that." I said, "Yes, I can. You find twelve people in 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 Knox County that'll convict me." They're not. Yeah. And he said, "Well, you got a point." Yeah, a really good point. Hit him in the mouth. So, the, the, you go to trial, and you have to have eight. You have to have eight trials before this gets done. <clears throat> when, when when the trials was over, and the the main the, the 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 main guy, what was his name? Was da who is it? Is it Davidson? Oh, the the ring leader was Davidson and Slash Boyd. Okay, when when Davidson, when you after the trial was over, did he ever? Does he ever say anything to you at all? Does he make contact no. with you or anything? No. I I got in trouble several times for pointing my finger like it was a gun and letting the hammer go. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, anytime he looked my way, I told him I was going to kill him. Um, and see, you got to understand, guys, I was a good old Christian country boy. Yeah. And for and for 14 years, all I want to do is kill people. I'd have done it. I'd have run over you in a car if I knew I could have got to them. It's understandable. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered. What, um, what, what role did the judge play that they were like, well, he was on drugs and he was not fit to oversee this trial? I mean, was he like a deciding vote, or was he a deciding? If he was the judge over it, yeah. But I mean, but was but, he coming to work? Like, what what drugs was he on? What was he taking? They, um, opioids. I mean, could, did they prove that he was high when he was sitting on the bench? They proved that he was taking those drugs during those trials. And then everything gets kicked back and the whole sure. thing starts over. All of them had the right to request a retrial. Mm -hmm. And three of them didn't. They were screwed. They had their DNA all over her Shannon's clothes, all over her inner. Um, you know, the, the part of your lip that connects to your gum. Yes. Know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. They rip that with oral sex. Mm. Mm. They tore that from, from her lip to her gum that was ripped open. And then they forced her to drink bleach. Trying to get rid of their DNA. But that didn't work. No. They got her. They got her. Man, it, it's enough to send a father to hell. I, yeah. To sit there and listen to them explain all the things that they did to her. I wouldn't do that to my dog if he bit me. So who who had <coughs> excuse me <coughs> which of them what who had the first idea to 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 start raping uh your daughter where where did that where did that even come up in this when they got her back to the house on Chipman Street was it Davidson 
Davidson was the first one, then Cobbins, his brother, and then Davidson and Cobbins and Davidson and Cobbins. They just were taking turns. And uh, uh, there's spe a lot of speculation was involved with, with Coleman going in because her boyfriend was Cobbins. And they, they suspected that some of the bruising that she had between her legs was being kicked mm -hmm. and they suspected that Coleman possibly was the one that was doing that because she was pissed off that her brother, their boyfriend was in there having sex with Shannon. Right. So how long you, you said you carried that, you know, you, you had murder on your mind for 14 years. What was it that made that switch? <laughs> I was thinking you might ask me that. Um, a miracle. Was it a mir you know, miracle that you witnessed or just a miracle that you had a change a of heart? That it happened. <clears throat> I, uh, I never felt any different from the day that we found Shannon till the, um, Sunday after Easter in 2017. Um, in 2009, I started a motorcycle club. Mm -hmm. It's a real deal. I mean, it was, we rode for Shannon's memory to protect her honor and to protect each other and that nobody in the shepherds would ever have to deal with what I dealt with alone like I did. So if something like this happened, you would ride out to them and create a sense of protection and unity and brotherhood. If, if one of our members, daughter was kidnapped we would be looking far before the cops did right right we found we found people we've had people contact us and their kid was missing and we found them so kind of a vigilante type group now it, no that's the way it started out okay um how many people Not were you, how many different cases were you involved with, with this motorcycle club? Or, or how many times were you uh, called out to a certain case and rode out there? Well, if I told you that, <laughs> I'd have to come kill you. <laughs> uh, more than once and less than 20 times, well, less than 10 times specifically about somebody missing. So right. we've helped people that were being threatened by Mexican gangs. We've, We've um, we showed up in a in a place that you wouldn't have wanted to go, and we were loaded for bear. Um, to help kids, it's amazing when those motorcycles crank up. Like you get a totally different attitude by a bunch of different shitheads. Yes, you do. So kind of like an equalizer is what uh, y'all were doing. Yeah, in a way. We need more uh, of that in the world. Yeah, we do. We sure do. And then the Sunday after Easter in 2017, it, something it became, happened. It became, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it became like we're tired of men sitting at home on a keyboard pecking away at how bad everything is. We need men to stand up and do something about it. It's very Amen. true. Amen. Well, we were doing that, and we still do today. Um, we help children. Uh, we, we make sure that kids have Christmas that wasn't going to have any. I'm talking about from outside lights all the way to the, the presents and Santa Claus and everything else. We've got a club member that 
that can dress up like Santa Claus. My stepdaughter is like the number two color person in the country. And, and she um, does his hair and beard. Mm-hmm. And hell, he looks like just what I grew up thinking Santa Claus looked like. <laughs> He's scary. Yeah. He, he going to dress up like Santa Claus this year for us, for the club. And, and we're going to have it where kids can get in and not have to stand in line for three hours at Bass Pro Shop. Right. You're going to come there, get in, get your picture made with Santa Claus, tell him what you want, and you're done. Um, we want to help kids. Um, help people, period. People that are up against odds bigger than they are. God bless you for that. There's a big need. And uh, But to answer your question, which is probably the most important thing to me about all of this is um, over the years, the mission of my motorcycle club hadn't changed. We're still the same today as we were the first day. Um, But over the years, I found out at one time in about a in about in about a four month period, I had over fifty members. <laughs> All they had to do was follow me. You give me your word, you follow me, whatever I'm doing, and you're in. Mm-hmm. Well. There's an old story in the, in the club world that it's better to have 10 people and you get in some shit in a bar somewhere and you look behind you and there's nine people standing there than it is to have a hundred and, and they're all gone but you. Right. Well, people leave. People get told to leave. New people come in. And we have a, uh, we lost a lot of people because we lost we we found out that a lot of people don't have any heart. And they they they'd rather be home behind the keyboard. But our numbers are strong enough to do what we do today. And over the years. More and more people in a, and more the way I like to put it is more and more people in in a as a percentage of the club were Christians. Nobody ever talked to me about Jesus Christ because that was the quickest way they could start a war, right? And they knew it. But it's amazing what a bunch of grown men and women can do when they're all praying for the same thing. And that was that one day, good Lord would find a way to get me back. And um, it's a dangerous thing. It started out was almost every member in my club at one point or another would say, hey, boss, um, don't you go to church with us next Sunday? And I just look at them and say, you know better than that. Mm-hmm. And then another one would do it and another one would do it. And, and it almost got to the point where the first thing out of somebody's mouth was wanting me to go to church with him, pissed me off. And they knew it. And my vice president at the time, he uh, came to me at my workplace and he said, boss, you got a minute? I got to talk to you. So we went outside. And he said, you're going to be pissed at me 
but there's only one person that I know of in my life that I have to follow their direction more so than I do yours. Two people. One's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. Yeah. And the other is the Lord. And he said, the Lord has been on me for a while. to talk to you and to tell you something. And I'm like, brother, say what you got to say. And I could tell he had a lump in his throat. I mean, he was, this a big old boy too. I'd have hated to try to whoop his ass right there. <laughs> um, I don't fight fair though. <laughs> fight to win. Yeah. He said, the Lord wants you to know that he didn't have anything to do with taking your daughter's life. There's no telling what the Lord could have done with Shannon's life. The way she loved kids. There's just no telling where, where, where her life would have taken her. But the Lord didn't have anything to do with taking Shannon's life. And he looked at me and he put his hand up on my shoulder and he squeezed my shoulder real hard and he said, evil did. Evil did that. Nothing but pure evil. Our enemy. Satan, he come here to destroy us any way he can. And he's done a damn good job of it, destroying you by taking Shannon. And if you keep going in the direction you're going, he's going to win. Yeah. Have you... He's going to be successful. He said he can't take you away from the Lord, but but he can sure take away a lot of your joy in heaven. Yeah. Have you read the book of Job? Because, I mean, it seems like there could be a lot of similarities yeah. with sure you and Job. Sure I have. Right? Sure I have. Ever since I was eight years old, I've been reading it. My point is, I went blind to everything. I didn't want the Lord in my life. I didn't, I didn't want to be responsible to him for my actions. Right. I didn't want his influence on me. I couldn't be his child and do what I wanted to do in my mind. How, how long after this then, meeting? Then, then he said, boss, I want you to do me one favor. I've done, I've, I've, I've never turned you down on anything you wanted me to do. I want you to do one thing for me. I said, brother, I'd do anything in the world for you. He said, I want you and Lori to go to church with me and Karen next Sunday, Easter Sunday. Boy, my blood pressure went to 2,000 over six. <laughs> yeah. I said, i tell you what I'll do, Danny. I'm going to go home. I'm going to ask Lori if she wants to go. And if she wants to go, I'll go. We've been married three years. Two years. We never talked about the Lord. We never talked about church. We never, she knew how I felt mm -hmm. before we got married. I go walking in the dead gum kitchen that, that evening when I left work and I said, Hey, baby, Danny Kimsey is wanting us to go to church next Sunday, Easter Sunday. It's Easter Sunday. You don't want to go, do you? 
I'd have bet you everything I had. I could have told you what she said. Turned around and smiled at me and said, yes, I'd love to go. I've been wondering when we were going to start going. Wow. Well, I stuck. So I went. And this preacher gave the most gruesome horrible picture of the crucifixion I'd ever heard. It was bone chilling, man. You know, it, it ain't like the old King James Bible where you got your Jesus on the cross and got two drops of blood coming out of each hand. Right. They mutilated him. Truth be told, you don't, we don't know if you could really tell what they took off that cross. From the beating? From the beating. They beat him with a cat of nine tails. You know what one of them suckers are, don't you? Yes. It's made to take the flesh off the meat and the meat off the bones. Right. He bled. Tor they tortured him. We did. Man, I was so ready to get out of that church. And the next Sunday, my wife informed me we was going again. <laughs> you know, I am the president of a motorcycle club. <laughs> I think, I could, think I could get by and by saying, shut up and get in the closet or whatever. <laughs> right. That don't work. That doesn't mine, work with her. Mine, mine will shoot me. <laughs> I went back. And this time he told a story about a missionary that planned this long, extravagant mission trip to go to some third world country. It took him several years. He goes on this mission trip. It takes him forever to get there. They're down this river on, in, in, in this third world country, and they get land up on this island or this beach on the river where, where this village is. And you know what happened? The villagers killed every one of them. Two years later, that missionary's wife put that same mission trip together again. They went back through all the stuff they had to go through. When they get back on that beach, you know what happened? Every member of that village was saved. And here's the kicker. She, the, the widow of that missionary, witnessed to the chief, the one that cut his head off and put it on a pole in front of his tent. Witnessed to him, and he was saved. Wow. What's that say about forgiveness? Yeah. On our anniversary ride, that second Sunday, I went back to church, was Shannon's birthday, and our anniversary ride at the club. By the time I got to the cemetery where the whole club was meeting, I couldn't hardly put one foot in front of the other. Mm -hmm. I was so tired, man. I've been fighting for so long. I broke every finger in both hands, hitting shit that wouldn't move. I'd been through it mentally, physically. I was wore out. And when I when we got to the cemetery and got to Shannon's grave and started our annual anniversary ride that's the first day we rode on her birthday mm -hmm. and I got to to her grave and it was like she was standing there smiling at me and I went down on my knee on her grave and said, Lord, just like you did with Peter, you know, Peter denied Christ. 
one of the first things that Christ did when he came out of the tomb was send for Peter and restored him back to where he was. And I got on my knee and I said, Lord, forgive me. I realize a lot of things now. This is all on me. But just like you did with Peter, restore me back to where I used to be. And brother, it all came back. Yeah. In that split second, every feeling I ever had, the love for the Lord, wanting to tell people about the Lord, all the things that I grew up doing, all came back. First thing I felt was my wife's hand on my left shoulder. The second thing was my VP's hand on my right shoulder. And the next thing I know, every one of the shepherds had moved in and was had their hands on me. Wow. Now I'm I'm a I've been for 14 years, I've been riding with Satan's bunch. And in one one church service, it all turned around. I spoke it. I think Lori left out of here. She's the one with the record keeper. But I think the last count was 294 churches. Wow, that's wow. amazing. It's a hell of a story of forgiveness for sure. That's just I, I didn't say anything about forgiveness. <laughs> Well, I'm still working on that. Still a hell of a story. I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I don't blame you. For I, any there's of it. no way. Mm, I. No. I could not have done what you have done. You're strong. I couldn't. <laughs> I'd be. Well, well, I'd be. Lo- you know, I'd still be wandering first, around in the darkness. You know what? One of the first things that came to my mind when I got on my motorcycle and started down the interstate going to the memorial. So they, they tore the house down and built a memorial there. And that's where we ride to every year from the cemetery to the memorial. I'm riding down the interstate. And the first thing that came to me was uh, doing things, how many things had happened that had helped so many people because Shannon died. Boy. The way she did. Mm. Those people wouldn't have been helped if Shannon was still with us. Now, don't get me wrong. I gave everything I got for 10 minutes for Shannon right now. Yeah. Give her everything I got. Yeah. Um, you still want your baby back. Yep. How how long does it take to have like a sense of normalcy? Like how, how long does it take for you to kind of pick up the pieces, whatever they are, and think, well, like I've got a, I've still got a life, and I've got to move forward with it. I've got to figure out how to do something good out of this incredible darkness. You see, the Lord didn't ever turn. You know, the second thing I thought about was that I turned my back on the Lord. He didn't turn His back on me. Right. All those good things that happened, they started happening the first week the shepherds existed. They'd been happening. I just didn't perceive it to be what it was. I perceived it to be, I'm helping people from the memory of my my daughter. Mm -hmm. No, the good Lord was putting it on our plate we had a lot of people, a lot of different kind of people come to us for help. And we helped them. 
how long does it take to yeah. get to the point to where? Well, just like pick it, like how long were you like, okay, like I, this is tragic, but let me do something good. When did the, when did the motorcycle club start? In 2009. So two years. Before the first trial had ever started. So it took you two years to, to turn this incredible darkness and think, okay, like how the hell, what, what good can come out of this? And it's, let's Brother, start the I'm shepherds. Gonna to, I'm going to try to explain it to you a different way. Those people were getting helped because we were riding for Shannon's memory. It didn't affect me. It didn't. It wasn't because I come out of the darkness. You're asking me a question there ain't no answer to because I'm still going through it every day. Right. Right. And it, then, um, <clears throat> you know the the. It's easy to get lost, and I get stumbled up in my faith all the time. Like, how could an all knowing and all loving God ever allow anything like this to exist? How is there? How is anything that's tragic? Kids with cancer. I mean, God, God, God doesn't give kids cancer. He don't cause all this bad stuff that's going on. The, the world today, the media, commercials, good God. Look at the commercials on TV today. Terrible. Target, what? Target's got a big uh, LGBTQIA whatever plus... Very first thing you walk into at uh, some of the targets now. So, I mean, yeah. there's another one you can't have. No more Bud Light, no more Miller Light. No more Bud Light, no more Miller Light. There's so, I mean, there's there's places, <clears throat> no Chick-fil-A, no, no. What the world, what what's going on is what the Bible says is going to happen. In the last days, it in the world's eyes, what's right is wrong and what's wrong is right. Hello? Yeah. They don't take no rocket scientists to figure out that's going on. I, I'm still interested in your question. How long did it take me I still don't know. Because you're still living it. Every, every day I see something on TV that that makes my blood boil. People do things that I see that makes me want to just go over there and knock the shit out of somebody for just being stupid. Yeah. God didn't do any of this. He don't give kids cancer. He don't. Evil does. That's what people got to understand. Satan is trying to destroy us. Jesus said, I'm going away and I'm coming back. But while I'm gone, Satan's going to rule this earth. Did he not? Yes. Then people got to wake up. The Bible says there's one thing that's an unforgivable sin. You don't blasphemy. You don't do, it's it's blasphemy. Well, blasphemy and that's a sin against God, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't believe in. All right. If you do not man be with man. The woman be with woman. That that's a no no. It's in the Bible. Black and white. Or in red, however you want to look at it. Do you think that yeah. we're in the end of days? Do you think that the yeah. end is near? Sure I do. Do you think we'll see it in our lifetime? I don't know. Our lifetime is a blink of an eye of his. Yes, it is. Eternity's a long time. When it's going to happen, I don't know. But I know this. I, I trust my pastor 
for a million different reasons. One is to live through what I did. But there is nothing, no prophecy in the Bible that has not been fulfilled. I'm 66 years old. My grandmother used to tell me all that, that we're in the last days. They used to laugh at her. You don't know that, Ma. <laughs> and those when, when my grandmother was saying that, there was things in the Bible that ain't happened yet that, that don't exist no more. There is no prophecy. Find me a prophecy in the Bible that has not been fulfilled. Okay, so if that's true, he can come any second. We may not finish this conversation. My bags ain't packed. I was I was in a desperate, bad situation. Home life. Love my kids. I stayed where I was because of my kids. My kids knew it. I was her father. I wasn't going anywhere. But the day came, I, I couldn't do it anymore. The Lord gave me a, a wife that we enjoy being together. We we love doing things. We play golf together. We we um we go shopping. We go shopping and don't buy nothing. <laughs> We go at Christmas, just hold hands and walk around and look. My son is prosperous in his field. He he works for the county sheriff's department, and, and he's doing magnificent in his job. That's his way of helping somebody every day. Um, How do we put those people out on the street making so little of money and then treat them like shit? Don't don't treat a cop like shit and don't burn the American flag in front of me Amen. because the, the dark side will come out. I, mean, I won't stand there and watch it. Don't tear no statue of Jesus down. You know, I, I got I, I I'm gonna tell you something. I believe this is America, the the the, the home of the free. We're free. Everybody's got a right to their opinion. It's like going back to the TV commercials. Everybody's got a right to your opinion. But don't force your opinion on me. That's exactly right. If that's what you want to think, you think it. But as a company like, like <laughs> Bud Light, you, you can't make a stand like that. You lose billions of dollars in business. 26% down. Because there's a bunch of rednecks like me out there. Don't, 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 as a, some of my best friends are black. Okay. <clears throat> Good friends. Don't tell me that you want equal everything when you got black television shows. I ain't seen no white television shows. I think white people get in trouble for trying to put on a white show, an all white show. What's all black? Yeah. You know, if you want to make it equal, everybody shut up and just live life and treat everybody like human beings. Be good and if you don't treat somebody like a human being, you're going to pay for it dearly. Oh, you know, other countries, if you steal something, they cut your arm off. You don't steal anything with that hand anymore. No. They don't have crime. <laughs> let, Shit. Let me ask you this. Did any did any of the families of the of the kids that done the, and other people that done this? Did any of their families ever reach out to you and apologize or anything from anybody on that side of the aisle? No, they supported them. 
That's crazy. And some, and some just sit there and shut up. Um, didn't, didn't none of them want to reach out to me. If they reached out to me today, I might feel different about it. But back then, they didn't want to get nowhere near me. What did, uh, one kid got the lethal injection, right? Have they put him to sleep yet? Um, he is, he is not. Uh, I hope that the Lord, well, somebody asked me at a church one night a question. And here was my answer. If I get 10 minutes with him before they kill him, I'm going to take three minutes And I'm going to tell him what I think of him and what he took from me. And then I'm going to take seven minutes and tell him how much he needs the Lord. That's all Christ ever asked us to do for what he did on the cross. Wow. Go tell others what I did for you. Wow. That's, that's, that's very, <clears throat> very, Jeez. that's some heavy stuff right there. The, um, you know what the, 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 bru the, the, one of the most brutal things that I learned in, in all these years dealing with this, the justice system in our country is broken. Yeah. Now, now a lot of people, y'all know that. <clears throat> Have you ever had a family member close to you go through a murder trial? No. A lot of people understand that the justice system is broken. All they got to do is watch the news if the news tells the truth. Which it probably doesn't. True enough. But most people know and understand that the justice system is broken, but I know it is. There's nothing fair about it. There's no fair trial. When, when, the, when the defense can lie and the DA's office has to tell the truth, is that fair? No. Now, one it's law, th there was a law that, that uh, changed because of this, right? Because now uh, in, for your daughter, if I've done my research correctly, uh, the defense can no longer go up there and uh, spout these lies or portray the victim in a negative light? No, that's an interesting story. One of the finest people I met during all this was uh, Leland Price, who works for the district attorney's office here. Um, he's a DA. When the last trial was over, except for Boyd's, because we just did it a couple of years ago, because we got him for two life sentences stacked on top of each other anyway. He would die in prison. Um, I said, Leland, out of all this stuff, there's one thing that hurt me the most and I'll spend the rest of my life telling people, and at every one of those churches, one of the things I do is I say, I owe this to my daughter. She did not do drugs. I had the proof. Yeah. Because there are idiots out there that did believe it. And when I'd hear about it, I make sure they change their mind. But... I said, I want, I want to create a law in Shannon's name, in her memory. And it's hanging on my wall right over there. It's called the Shannon Christian Act. I told him what I want to do is I want to make sure that defense attorneys cannot come in a court of law 
where they have sworn an oath to never ask a question of a witness that they know the answer is going to be a lie. Come into a courtroom and lie their ass off. Mm -hmm. No proof of anything they're saying. They're just saying it. Right. I said, to most people, that don't matter. To me, it does because they're slandering my daughter. And I'm going to hurt somebody for doing that. And if anybody ever does it now that the court is done, they're going to deal with me. Maybe And maybe my cousin Rip. Yeah. I want you to help me create a law that prohibits them from doing that. He said, Gary, it's already law. They can do it. That's a law. They can present any defense they want to present. They can prove nothing. Right. They can say whatever they want to say. I don't know how we're going to get around that. Mm -hmm. I said, you're the only attorney I ever knew that graduated from law school from Harvard. Find a way. And several months later, he called me and had me come up to the courthouse to his office. And when he read it to me the first time, all I could do was say, what? Did you just say, what in the world? He created it. We got two senators and a congressman behind us. They put it on the table, and we got it passed 100%. Wow, that's great. That don't, that don't happen often. No. When I spoke to the Senate, every one of them sitting at that bench was crying. Mm -hmm. And there was and also Chris, there was another one for Chris, right, for the, the Chris right, Lisa Mac, but, which... All but of the, the retrials would have been aver avoided. Yes. Sh the Shannon Christian Act, this is so friggin' genius. The, it states, you know, like the defense can talk about and make a story they want to about Shannon. But the DA's office couldn't bring up the fact that Davidson and Boyd had been in prison for carjacking because the, the, the district attorney's office cannot bring up anything prior to the day of the murder. That's back. They can't say that they were hoodlums, that they were, they were in trouble all the time. They, this and that, and this and that, that's improperly influencing the jury. Just like the pictures were. The pictures I don't. The pictures I still can't wrap my head around how that can't how that gets thrown out. I mean that's I, I don't know. You know I mean like they said like okay nothing prior to the day before the murder or whatever it is but like this is that's part of the evidence. This is part of the evidence. Yeah. Right. It was a gruesome crime. Why shouldn't the jury see gruesome? Yeah. Yeah. Did the verdict come out the but, way you wanted it to be, with what they gave them? Y'all getting ahead of me. Wait a minute. Remember that question. Okay. I'll, I'll write the it Shannon, down. The Shannon Gale Christian, I mean, the uh, Shannon Christian Act states that if the defense brings up anything prior to the day of the murder about a victim, then the district attorney's office can recall any witness that they had and, and talk about the fact that they were in prison and all that stuff. It's like, you can't bring up anything prior to the day of the murder unless the defense does it first. If the defense does it, then the DA's office can lower the boom on them. Right. I've had, I, I think the last count I had, it was 21 times the Shannon Gale Christian Act has been used in court in Knox County, Blount County, Sevier County, all the surrounding counties. Wow. 
it works. Wow. And, and every time that I hear that, that, that a district attorney's office in any of those counties has used it, it's like, yes, mm -hmm. it's like winning the Super Bowl. Yeah. Now, what was that question? Do, were you happy with the verdict that they got? Are you happy with the sentencing? No. What, 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 what would you like to see different? Death penalty on all of them. That's what we went for. They, I had the choice. Do you, I, the, the attorney general said, if you, if you go for the death penalty on all of them, you're going to be dealing with this for the rest of your life. I said, I got nothing else to do. Yeah. I, th I think I, I'm just because of that. appeals and stuff. Is that what, is that what he meant by that? Yeah. 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 And I, and I, believe, I mean, you know, you're sitting on death row, but we can't kill anybody. I mean, you know, heaven forbid you you've done this, Tennessee, you've done this heinous thing to get there, but we can't, we yeah. can't kill you. Well, Tennessee's cranking it up. They've killed like six in the last two years. So we're getting closer. I think they ought to do it noon the next day. So the day that, after your trial, they should have draped, oh yeah. took them out the flagpole and, I think by law, what they ought to do is turn them over to the families. I'm still an eye for an eye kind of guy. I know that's Old Me? Testament, but. I, hey, <clears throat> I always said the right thing to do is to turn, once they've been guilty of 48 counts, get them to the, get them to the family. Yeah. Yep. I agree Let with you. Let us deal with the Lord when we get to heaven. That's right. I'm all for that, but <laughs> couldn't get nobody to buy that. Am <laughs> I satisfied with it? No. Well, that's what I, w I was uh, wondering about that. We had to give up. We had two life sentences in 65 years stacked all on top of each other on George Thomas. Now I admit George Thomas was a, dro a dope head. That's all he was. He stayed high. He didn't ever touch Shannon. They all said that. It it, it was um. He he didn't he didn't he did the least of anybody. Coleman was left there in the house twice with Shannon by herself. She could have gone to the gas station a hundred yards from that house and called the cops and didn't do nothing. Right. Thomas just sat there and smoked dope. And we got the most on him other than Davidson. Thomas got life without parole and 60-something years. But with Thomas, for some unknown godly reason, we got two life sentences and different jury and, and 65 years stacked on top of it. Now, he was sunk. How does that happen? What did, what did, what did, what did the people say? Like, how does he, how does a guy with the least amount of involvement get the biggest penalty? I don't know, brother. Never made it, sense to you. Uh, different jury. Right. Justice system is so screwed up anyways. It's, it's screwed, man. It, it's nothing about it makes sense. So we what, had to give, we had to give George Thomas 75 years, day for day, took two life sentences off of his sentence. That means he'll be 79 years old when he gets his first chance for parole. But we had to give him that, make a deal with him, so he would come back and testify against Eric Boyd in Eric Boyd's second trial that he killed Chris. We knew he killed Chris. Mm -hmm. he, he was, pardon my French, but he was a he was a uh, prison queer. Really? Yeah. And that's Boyd. why he raped Chris. Yeah. He got his jollies raping Chris. Now, when in order to get Boyd, because the Newsoms had sat there the whole time and never heard the words guilty of murder of Chris. He was shot in the back twice in the head once, set on fire on a railroad track, was raped repeatedly with objects. 
just like Shannon was. And they had never heard guilty. If you think I had it bad, what do you think they felt? Mm. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I had to go along with it so we could get Eric Boyd for murder of Chris. Right. So that I ain't happy with. I'm glad the Newsom's finally get a get some peace. But I ain't happy that we gave up a day. The only one I'm happy, we, we got life without parole, two life without parole sentences stacked on Eric Boyd. He ain't never coming out. If y'all got kids, he's never going to hurt them. Got two young boys, eight and four. Well, he ain't never going to hurt them. He's never coming out of state prison in, in Tennessee. He don't get no parole. He don't get nothing. He's dead. He's going to die there. Cobbins is going to die there. He ain't going to hurt your kids. What about Davidson? Davidson is on death row. They're going to put him to and sleep. Eventually, going, he'll probably I'm, he might he's probably got a better chance of dying of old age and getting put to sleep. Unfortunately, I'm like Jeff, I, I hope set that motherfucker on fire. Yep. I hope I hope that I live to that day. Um, because I'll be there. I want to see it. Probably like to push the needle, push the plunger. Or how do they oh, do is it? Is it lethal injection in Tennessee? Well, they have a choice now. They can have lethal injection or they can have the electric chair. I wouldn't care which way he goes. I just want to be there to watch him go. Now, that's not to say that you're talking about a confused man. That's me. Because I have a ward that died on a cross and there was a thief right next to him. And, and he asked him to save him, and he said, today you'll be in paradise with me. It ain't never too late. But thank God, that ain't my decision. That's between him and the Lord. I don't have to make that decision. I hope he rots in hell. I'll have to stand in front of Jesus one day and say, I know. I, I I don't deserve to be here. But so do I. I. I wish I wished I could put a bullet in each one of them's head after I had an hour to do whatever I wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've had I've had more evil thoughts than you can possibly dream of. I, 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 and you have every right to every one of those evil thoughts. I don't think there's anybody listening right now that wouldn't go to the exact same place. Yeah, you wouldn't. That's exactly right. I mean, it's just to think of like you, you know, that's your baby. It's a person that you brought into this world and loved with your entire heart and had such a bright future and thought of every, all the good that this kid would do and taken away in an instant. We, um, we're lucky. Yeah. That, that Jesus Christ is as forgiving as he is. Cause won't none of it. People ask me all the time, how are you doing, man? I just look at them and say, better than I deserve. And I mean it. Yeah. Because I'm human and I, I can't make the hurt go away. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about her. I hear a song that me and her liked. Um, I hear a saying that she always used to say. Um, me and her had this thing about saying, I love you. I love you more. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. Right. Well, that's what we were doing when she called me that night. And I said, I love you more and hung up on her. 
God, do I wish I had that phone back. Yeah. There's so many. I'm, I'm going to tell you all something. Y'all, y'all are young men. I am. Jeff's boys. not. I'm not young. I'm 55. <laughs> okay. Well, that's young. <laughs> um, it's, it's perception, you know. Um, if you've got a family, if you've got kids, you got a wife, don't let one day go by that you don't tell every one of them face-to-face that you love them because you ain't guaranteed nothing. You ain't guaranteed another chance. I was lucky. I got to tell Shannon I loved her. I got to tell her I loved her more. Um, You'd think I need a psychiatrist. A good friend of mine got me to go see what is rated the number one um, psychiatrist in the state. I went to him three times, and I sat there for an hour at a time. I kept telling everybody, I don't need no psychiatrist. I need somebody to let them out of jail. <laughs> But good point. They, they they just kept insisting and kept insisting. So I went to this guy. I went three times. I was there an hour at a time, and I did nothing but tell him how much I hated them and wanted to kill them. After the third hour, third time I went, I, stu- I stood up when he reminded me that our hour was up. I stood up and I said, Doc, let me ask you a question. What's, what the hell's wrong with me? And he said, absolutely nothing that I can tell. Yeah. As a father, you've not told me anything that I wouldn't feel. And I said, well, why am I coming to you? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, to have somebody to talk to. I said, for God's sake, doc, I got thousands and thousands of, I got, I got five Facebook pages. Three of them have 5,000 friends each. One is a public page, and I got 37,000 people following me. And I got another one that that 25,000 people are following me. What do I need with somebody to talk to? I got all kind of people that listen as long as I talk. Yeah. And he said, come see me if you ever need to talk to me. (laughs) That was it. That was it. <laughs> and you're you're having, that, to, you're having to pay to talk to him. You can talk to these people the, for free. Well, the state was paying for it. Oh, okay. And with the victims acts thing, which is another joke. Um, victims don't have any rights. Only the defense. Yeah. The yeah. justice system is broken, and it can't be fixed. You know what we'd have to do to fix it. Flip the whole thing upside down. When I when I came out of River Bend Prison, because the Attorney General tried to get me to take a plea deal, if if Thomas was would have given up Boyd, then if we give him life without parole, and he told me life without parole was was twenty four. 23-1, and I said, no, it's not. Life without prison, uh, life without parole, it's just what it is, life without parole. Right. He said, no, it's, it's 23-1. I said, I'll believe it when I see it. He said, how will, you, how will you believe it if you see it? And I said, I want to go to Riverbend. I want to see it. I want to talk to the warden. He called the governor and set it up. There was 12 people from the district attorney's office never been in a state prison. The sheriff went. The chief of police went. They'd never been in a state prison. When we walked out, the sheriff walked up to me and said, Gary, they had told us we couldn't smoke because it was state property. Back then, I smoked cigarettes. I walked out the door walked to the curb and lit up a cigarette 
and was daring somebody to tell me I couldn't smoke because I saw people on death row smoking a cigarette. Right. Yeah. Y'all kiss my ass. I'm going to smoke a cigarette. Yeah. Um, he walked out of that prison and walked straight up to me and, and shook my hand, grabbed my hand. He wouldn't let go. And he got right up in my face and said, let me tell you what it would be if I had my way after seeing what I've seen today. I'm looking at him. I thought he was going to chastise me for being such an ass. And I said, what? And he said, we'd go back to Knoxville in these fancy cars, turn these fancy cars in, the fancy guns in, and we'd get us a good horse, a good Winchester, and a six-shooter, and find us a new Judge Roy Bean and start the fuck over. Yeah. That's what it would take. That's what it would take. That's, that's what, what it, it would take to fix the corruptness that's in the justice system. Well, it's not just, like, I mean, it's, it's, right. it goes way beyond the justice system in my mind. I mean, it goes clear to the top. Every three letter agency, FBI, CIA, ATF, they're all corrupted. Big Pharma is corrupted. Time. Senators are corrupted. How in, how in the hell is it legal for a senator to make stock trades on, on, on laws that he's that making, they are making, how, how in the hell in America in 2023 is it, is that legal guys that are making decisions on the highest level on what go on the law of the land are able to make stock trades. Everything's broken. I've had, I've had thousands of people say, why don't you run for Senator? We'll vote for you. Yeah. I said, because I would look really silly to walk in there with a pair of regular cowboy cut blue jeans on, cowboy boots, a big buckle, a nine millimeter on my hip, carrying a goddamn Henry in my arm, walking in there and sitting down with my cowboy hat and flipping it and setting it down on my desk and say, now, anybody want to jack with me? <laughs> That's what the world needs. That's what we need, though. They got that dipshit from yeah. Fetterman there. Look how he dresses, like Lurch. We need we need regular people running for that's our problem. We don't have regular people running. Uh, you got to be a multi multi millionaire to run for office because it's such a corrupt place and it hasn't just started. This has been going on for hundreds of years in our country. We're just starting to see more and more of it these days. Look look at it this way. This is what I learned by getting the Shannon Christian Act through. I had a I had two senators that I, I consider to be my good friends today. One of them is the Speaker of the House. Um, or the Speaker of the Senate. The, 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 the What is it? Next to the Governor? Lieutenant Governor? Lieutenant Governor, thank you. One of them is the Lieutenant Governor. That man has done everything in his power to destroy those five people. He comes to anybody, Coleman's uh, parole hearing, he showed up to speak against it. Yeah. You know, he don't have to do that. That he, He's a good man. But in watching him get the Shannon Christian Act through, okay, look, the three of us are senators, okay? Mm-hmm. All right. I'm going to send my people into your office, one of y'all's offices, and they're going to say, I want you to vote for this bill. If you vote for this bill for me, I will vote for your so-and-so bill. Man, the first person, if I was a senator, the first person walked in my office and said that, I'd throw them out the freaking window. Right. Don't come with me with that little crap. Yeah. If you can't vote for something because it's right and it's what is good for the people in this state, then get out of my office. Yeah. That's what that's what drives me crazy with these party lines that we see. Well, no Republican from, can vote for anything that a Democrat does and vice versa. Like everybody's got to vote along party lines. That's horseshit. You should be doing what's good for your constituents, whether it is Democrat leaning or Republican leaning. 
it don't it don't matter who it is, what color they are, nothing. You ought to vote for stuff that is good for the people and the economy and and that's it. That's yeah. the way you ought to be. And there's about one percent of them that are. Yeah. That I've been able to see. Let me ask you this one last question from me because we've gone on two hours and I know you've got you've got things to do. Had this and I know the media was calling for this to be a, a hate crime. What would that have changed as far as the way the trial would have proceeded or a verdict that would have been rendered if if a hate crime would have been um, allowed in? If if there was a hate crime in this state, I believe there is in Texas. But if there was a hate crime, if we declared it a hate crime or racial, then what would have happened? It would have been rights. It would have been um, people burning up buildings. And no telling where it would have ended or ended up. Um, the reason that, and, and that, to my dear black friends out there, you know me, um, I'm not a racist, but what I don't like is when you declare that you you want equality. You already got equality. There's a knocking going on that I hear. That's in my washer. Oh, is it? I, I hope. <laughs> if it ain't. If it ain't, you Lord, got a problem. If it's I'm not, you got a problem. I'm coming through the door now. Gosh, <laughs> I got to go. Um, it's gone now. It would have been, it would have been, um, On national news, um, but the reason it didn't go there is because there is no white Al Sharpens. Right. There is no white bleeder for our equal rights. No. There's not. Um, no, had the, had the roles been reversed, it, the, Al Sharpton would have been there the next day, stoking Jesse the flames. Jackson, Jesse Jackson, all of them, they'd have been here right. with bells on. Right. It would have been like and it would have been Ferguson all over again. Then, and then you got all the people in the state of Tennessee that's focusing on that instead of what happened. Right. Right. And it wasn't good for us, the two families, if it would have gone that way. Um, it, it wasn't racist. They didn't go looking for white kids to carjack. Right. Just, just pure but, evil. But once they had them, once they had them, it became racist. Because they wanted what my daughter had. The old, the little rich girl from, from uh, Farragut. Mm -hmm. Got all these clothes in the car and all that stuff, you know. All the shoes and all the stuff. Shannon had four bags of stuff that she was fixing to take to a consignment shop. And the next thing I know, you got half the prostitutes in Knoxville is wearing my daughter's stuff. Mm. Fuck. But as far as like the legal proceedings or a verdict rendered on these individuals, that wouldn't have changed if this would have been declared a hate crime. The only thing that would have changed it is the peoples that live in this state that became jury members. Uh -huh. He could have took their focus off of what happened and, and put it on what was going on on TV. Right. Right. Uh, the judge may have, you know, in 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 this all the murder trials, 
they all asked for a different venue and they didn't get any, none of them got it. This happened in Knoxville. We're going to try it with the population of Knoxville. That's, that's the way the DAs pushed it, and that's the way the judges saw it, and that was only fair. Where did they try to go? Where did they think they would get a different verdict? Well, the law says that you can't go more than the next county that adjoins your county. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't have gone anywhere because the whole state was talking about this right. for two right. years yeah, or longer. Yeah. So... I don't, they couldn't go outside the state based on the law. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. Having the venue changed, um, I will agree that this, the, this, the city of Knoxville, Tennessee was appalled. Um, they, um, but I think everybody in every other county was appalled. Yeah, it should be everywhere. So I don't think that, um, that it would have been any different. Yeah. So what? What is, uh, what's next for Gary? You just continue on with your ministry and, uh, the, the, the well, motorcycle club, you, more of that. I, I, um, I don't plan to quit. I don't plan to shut the shepherds down because that's shutting a venue for Shannon's memory to be kept alive. So I don't, I don't see shutting that down. Um, I, um, can I mention the, what you're doing? We've not heard that yet. My wife is working on some projects with, uh, some pretty, um, cool people. Can you share any of that hey. today or is it still no, under wraps? My wife's an attorney, so I, she just told me I can't say anything about <laughs> that. Sports, just be be on the lookout. What I'm really scared of is that nine millimeter in her purse. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I and understand. Let, let, me say, let me say this. Yes, sir. I want to encourage everybody that's listening to me. If you're a father, you're a husband. Don't ever be disillusioned to the fact that this ain't gonna happen to you. This can't happen to me. If you're a father and you don't take the opportunities that's out there to, to get your children some measure of protection, whether it be a carry permit, learn how to use a weapon, how to use it safely and how to use it effectively if you ever need it. Or if it's Taekwondo or Kung Fu or whatever it is. If, if you don't get your be responsible enough to know that this kind of thing can happen to your child. You're an idiot. And you need to do something to get those kids an opportunity, if this ever happened to them, just a chance that they could get away and walk away from this. You're, you, you just ain't the brightest bulb in the lamp. Right. And if you're a husband and your wife is going to work and coming back home and traveling from one part of town to the next, and stopping at gas stations and stopping at the drugstore and the grocery store and all that. If you don't think something could happen to your wife, you're out of your mind. It happens every day. You don't want it to happen to you. Give her a chance to go home if it does happen to her. 
Yep. My wife carries a weapon everywhere she goes. So do I to this day. I don't go to work. I work three days a week at a golf course so I can play golf free. <laughs> um, but going go, when I leave this house, I've got my weapon on me because what happened to Shannon's never going to happen to anybody else in my family. My son's wife carries my, my, my wife carries my stepchildren carry. Be prepared, be vigilant, go out there and take, take, take the measures. Opportunity to, to, to do something to give your people a chance to go home if evil ever comes at them. Because right. evil's out there. It's everywhere. We got to be ready for it. Very, very wise words. Well, listen, it, it has been an incredible honor talking to you, and I um, I am thankful to have been able to have spent this time with you. Um, if there is ever anything that we could ever do for you out here in West Texas, please uh, let us know. You know, I know you can't tell us when, you know, when the motorcycle gang is uh, riding, but if y'all ever needed a place to stay or anything like that, you get out to West Texas. Uh, you've got both of our numbers, so please don't hesitate to call. We'd love yes, to sir. do, we'd love to do anything that we could ever do to uh, help the amazing cause that you have and, you know, keep, uh, keep, doing, keep, keep doing what keep you're doing. doing. Keep, keep up the good fight because one day good will prevail. Gary, we appreciate it, man. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. And you have a wonderful God bless night. You. Thank you, sir. You bye. bye. That's a strong man. Mm, I couldn't do that. No. Mm -mm -mm. Very forgiving person. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. What a what a what a terrible story, but a good one to be told. All right, thank y'all for listening to us. We appreciate y'all. Uh, Patreon June first, the Big Honker Podcast. We'll have videos there. Uh, we'll have more details coming out here soon on that. Now's thank not the time. No, thank you and God bless y'all. Not even time for this. Ladies and gentlemen, this episode of the podcast, uh, it's one of the heaviest ones that we've ever done. We sit down and listen to Gary Christian. Um, if you haven't, if you're unaware, um, you can Google Christian Newsom murder in Knoxville. And it is one of the most heinous crimes that I have ever read about, heard about. And this is the father of the daughter that was involved. That this is the father of the daughter that was involved in this gruesome uh, kidnapping and rape and murder. And I mean, just it's very, very heavy. But um, for a long time, this guy's walked in the darkness, but he has found the light, and he is now uh, he's now traveling and spreading the gospel of Jesus at different places. So. Incredible man, incredible, incredible story, and uh, we hope you enjoy this episode.